This test is part of a 12 test series that will certify the new design for crewed Artemis missions. The engine ran for its full planned 720 seconds, the longest duration to date. At Kennedy Space Center in Florida, technicians have been testing the solar array wings for the Artemis II service module. Orion will have four solar wings drawing in 11 kilowatts of power from the sun. Some of the avionics for Artemis II have already been to space. Technicians finished cleaning and removing avionics on the Artemis I crew module, which will be used on the Orion capsule for Artemis II in 2024. Now we are at T-minus 12 minutes and counting from the liftoff of the 28th Commercial Resupply Services mission from both NASA and SpaceX to the International Space Station. So let's bring back Zach now to tell us more about Dragon's flight history. Zach? Thanks, Jasmine. For those of you following along, you'll know that it's already been a very busy year and couple of weeks for Dragon vehicles at the International Space Station. CRS-28 marks SpaceX's fourth Dragon mission of 2023 following the launches of Crew-6, CRS-27, and AX-2. The Dragon spacecraft supporting today's mission will be joining Crew-6 and Dragon Endeavor, which have been on station since March. So in order to make room for AX-2 and CRS-28 at the Harmony Zenith port on the ISS, the four members of Crew-6 underwent a port relocation on May 6th. And put another way, uh, Dragon moved parking spots to make room for the incoming Dragons. A few weeks later, on Sunday, May 21st, Dragon and the crew of AX-2 lifted off from Historic Launch Complex 39A at NASA's Kennedy Space Center and arrived at station about 15 and a half hours later. And this is Dragon's fastest launch to docking time for a human spaceflight mission. After eight days of living and conducting research on the space station, Dragon Freedom undocked from the orbiting laboratory and returned the AX-2 crew back to planet Earth off the coast of Florida at 11.04 p.m. Eastern on Tuesday, May 30th. And this made room for the Dragon vehicle supporting today's mission. From the beginning, Dragon was designed to fly cargo and humans to and from space. And since Dragon's first visit to the space station in May 2012, we've come a long way. In that time, as I mentioned earlier, Dragon has visited the ISS 37 times, and nine of those missions carried crew. In fact, the first time Dragon flew people was just about three years ago with SpaceX and NASA's Demo-2 mission to the space station. NASA astronauts Bob Behnken and Doug Hurley took the first flight on Dragon on May 30th, 2020, returning human spaceflight capabilities to the United States for the first time since the space shuttle retired in 2011. The launch of Demo-2 also marked the first time in history that a commercial company successfully took astronauts to orbit. And since then, SpaceX has launched a total of 10 human spaceflight missions to space. And to help enable greater flexibility for future Dragon missions, SpaceX is preparing our neighboring pad, Space Launch Complex 40, at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida to support both cargo and crew missions. As we fly more and more people to and from space, human spaceflight becomes more accessible and creates more opportunities for humanity to become a spacefaring civilization. And now I'll turn it back to Jasmine at KSC to take a look at one of the payloads flying on today's mission. Jasmine? Thank you, Zach. One experiment on CRS-28 could be used to predict your uh, risk for certain diseases, aging, and how our bodies heal. Earlier this week, I got the chance to speak with the brains behind Genes in Space 10. Joining us now is Pristine Onwaha, a high school student from East Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Welcome, Pristine. Thanks for having me. Of course, happy to have you here. So can you tell us a little bit about how you're feeling a high school student with your experiment heading to the International Space Station? It's honestly a dream come true. This idea started off originally in my head, and now it's going to be a reality pretty soon, so I'm really excited. Of course, we love that excitement, Pristine, and we cannot wait to see your dreams realized. Can you break down what is the Genes in Space 10 experiment? The experiment the experiment involved telomeres, and these are the repetitive sequences that cap the ends of our chromosomes. On Earth, telomeres normally shorten as we age, but for astronauts in space, they actually appear to get longer. And so with that, I developed um, an experiment to see if that process could be linked to the activity of stem cells. Now, in the development of that experiment, something really important was measuring telomere length. But it turns out that isn't something that can really be done on the ISS. Instead, experiments involving DNA link measurement need to be sent down to Earth, and that costs time and resources. So with that, the Genes in Space team and I got thinking, what if we developed an experiment that could help 
address that. And so we developed an experiment that will allow astronauts on the ISS to detect the fourfold difference in DNA length. And so with that, it opens the door up for more kinds of research to be done on the ISS, um, such as into genetic monitoring, because being in space makes you more prone to genetic mutation. So that's something that can help with that. Also opens the door up for more research into telomeres to be done and even broader. Christine, that is so exciting. And your experiment was chosen out of over 600 applications. So what advice do you have for students who are also interested in this opportunity? Yeah, I would just encourage other students to just explore their passions in space biology and pursue it as best as you can. That's what I did, and it led me to where I am here. Exactly. Very excited to have you here. And tell me, what are your plans after high school? I mean, you've got some great things on the horizon, right? Yeah, so in the fall, I'll be headed off to UNC Chapel Hill. Um, I'm planning on studying either biology or bio chemistry, and I'm really excited to get more involved with biological research in the future, especially space biology. Of course. Thank you so much for joining us today, Christine. Thanks for having me. Thanks again to Christine for speaking with us. And she is not the only student experiment going up on CRS 28. STEM engagement is very important to us here at NASA for the future of the Artemis generation. All right, now we are just about seven minutes and counting until liftoff of CRS 28. So let's bring back Megan here on Florida Space Coast and Zach live at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California to walk us through the final moments of the countdown. Take it away. Thanks, Jasmine. It's T-minus 6 minutes and 50 seconds, and the SpaceX team is currently working no significant issues, and the vehicle is healthy. Weather is currently 80% go, and the range is ready to support today's mission. At this point, Rocket Propellant 1, or RP-1 fuel, is completely loaded on the second stage and nearly complete on the first stage. Liquid oxygen, or LOX, loading is currently underway on both stages and will complete at the T-minus 2 minutes uh, mark to launch. We're also loading helium gas into both stages. Falcon 9 uses helium as a pressurant to backfill the propellant tanks as LOX and RP-1 are consumed by the Merlin engines during ascent. Helium load began before the broadcast went live and will continue to top off until about a minute and a half before launch. And about 40 seconds ago, SpaceX performed the engine chill. That's when the team flowed a small amount of the super chilled liquid oxygen into the Merlin engine's turbo pumps. They're basically prepping the propulsion system for the full flow of liquid oxygen. By doing this, they avoid, avoid a thermal shock to the system, ensuring engine startup Stage one fuel well. load is complete. And you heard that call out for stage one fuel, uh, RP, uh, fuel load complete. Now, Dragon also began its startup sequence at T-minus 35 minutes when it coordinated timing with Falcon 9. The spacecraft is currently undergoing vehicle health checks. It will enter terminal count at T-minus 5 minutes with the next big step just a minute before liftoff when Dragon will transition to internal power. Now, you may have noticed those white clouds around the vehicle. Those are completely normal. They are chilled gas above the LOX tank, with, LOX tank liquid surface that we vent overboard to maintain pressure in the tank as needed. And when that gas comes out into contact with the warm, humid Florida air, the air condenses into clouds and water. Now, we are at the eye, Bob, right now, we should see the... Account. Falcon 9 tanks are pressurizing for strong back retract. The transporter erector, the tra Dragon is internal the count transporter and internal power. Team. The transporter erector, or TE, is used for vehicle rollout and to route propellants and electrical power to the vehicle in preparation for launch. And once those clamp arms have fully opened, the TE will then retract away from the rocket in preparation for liftoff. We have a hot mic on the countdown net. All parties check your key panels. Strombeck lower has started. We should see those clamp arms opening in about 15 seconds from now. Now those clamp arms are located just below the trunk of the vehicle, which is beneath the Dragon spacecraft. And there you can see those clamp arms beginning to open around the booster. Now in these last few minutes before T0, Falcon 9 is performing final health checks on its primary communications, avionics, and propulsion systems in preparation for flight. And we may hear callouts that engines are sufficiently chilled as we get a little closer to liftoff. Clamp arm should be fully open, and the transporter erector, that strong back, is going to recline away from the rocket.
Now you may have noticed in some of these shots, the Falcon 9 booster supporting today's mo mission is covered in quite a bit of soot, and that is because it previously supported NASA Crew 5, GPS 3, Space Vehicle 6, Inmarsat 6F2, and one Starlink mission. And you can see that strong back slowly reclining away from the vehicle. Stage one, locks load is complete. This launch will bring about 7,000 pounds of hardware, crew supplies, and science to the space station. One research project will study the effects of space on human DNA. Another will study the effects on plant DNA. Findings from both could help us advance things here on Earth, but also prepare us for future, farther missions into space. And Dragon will be docked to the space station for about a month before returning home. Now checkouts of the second stage thrust vector control actuators are now underway. This is often referred to as an engine wiggle test. This is when SpaceX moves the thrust nozzles slightly to make sure the guidance hardware is ready for flight. SpaceX will do the exact same test on the first stage engines, but that happens just seconds before ignition. Now, Dragon is also performing its final health checks to make sure all of the vehicle's primary systems are ready stage for its two, lock with complete. the International Space Station. Dragon is and there's that call-out that stage two lock. Call out that stage two locks loading is complete. That wraps up propellant loading for both stages of the Falcon 9. And as I mentioned earlier, you may have seen those white clouds around the vehicle. Ground gas those close clouds out. you see are the chilled gas above the LOX tank liquid surface that we vent overboard. And when that gas comes out in contact with the warm Florida air, the air condenses into clouds and water. Now Dragon is about to transition into internal power. Also Falcon 9 uh, computers will then enter startup mode, which is when the Falcon 9 flight computers take control of the countdown, guiding the rocket through the last seconds before liftoff. You should hear a call out about startup shortly. Falcon 9 is in startup. Dragon is in countdown. Both stages are now pressurizing for launch. At T minus 45 seconds, we'll hear the SpaceX launch director verify go for launch. We'll go for launch. There you go. And at launch, the International Space Station will be flying 260 miles over the North Atlantic, south of St. John's, Newfoundland. T minus 30 seconds. Fifteen seconds. T minus ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Ignition, engine full power, and lift off of PRS twenty eight. Go Falcon, go Dragon. Lift off of about seven thousand pounds of science and cargo including a new pair of solar arrays to boost power on the space station. seconds, Falcon 9 has successfully lifted off from Historic Launch Complex 39A in Florida. And we're now coming up on max Q in about 20 seconds from now, and this is the point of maximum aerodynamic pressure that the vehicle will go through during its flight. And there's that call out that Falcon 9 is supersonic, traveling faster than the speed of sound. There you heard the call out for Max Q. Coming up next are three events back to back. The first of which is main engine cutoff or MECO. And this is when all nine Merlin 1D engines on the first stage shut down. 
after those nine engines shut down, the first and second stages will separate, and this is also called out over the nets as stage separation. From there, the second stage will ignite its Merlin vacuum engine to boost Dragon to low Earth orbit during SES or second engine start one. And this whole sequence takes about 15 seconds. Should be expecting that call out for main engine cutoff in about 40 seconds from now. Some amazing views of our Falcon 9 vehicle as it takes our Dragon spacecraft to orbit. And in just about 10 seconds, we should see that main engine cut off. Nico? Stage separation. In that ignition. And there you heard those callouts and probably saw on your screen, main engine cutoff, followed by stage separation, and then second engine start one. As I mentioned earlier, we're flying an MVAC nozzle, uh, a shortened MVAC nozzle on our second stage. If you're just tuning in, you're watching a live webcast for the 28th commercial resupply mission to the International Space Station for NASA. This is SpaceX's 38th mission for 2023 and the fourth Dragon flight to the International Space Station this year. We lifted off from Kennedy Space Center's historic launch complex 39A just about three and a half minutes ago. Now on your screen on the left side, you can see our Falcon 9 first stage, which is going to uh, descend back towards Earth. And the second stage on the right side of your screen, which is carrying the Dragon spacecraft. Now, as a reminder, today's mission hey, marks the fifth for flight me, yeah. for this Falcon 9 booster. Falcon 9 booster, which previously supported the Crew-5, GPS-3, Space Vehicle-6, Inmarsat-6 F-2, and one Starlink mission. In order to make its way back to our drone ship, a shortfall of Gravitas, the Falcon 9 first stage has two more burns to execute. The first is the entry burn, where three of the Merlin engines will reignite. This helps slow the stage down as it re-enters the upper part of the Earth's atmosphere. The entry burn is followed by the landing burn, and this is a single engine burn that brings the vehicle speed down rapidly in order to land on the drone ship. Now, occasionally with the Falcon 9 first stage on the left side of your screen, you may see some oh, small white puffs, and those are nitrogen gas bursts that are used for attitude control. You can also see there on your screen a pair of the hypersonic grid fins. Falcon 9 is equipped with four of these grid fins, which are comprised of titanium, and they are positioned near the top of the first stage. Once in the atmosphere, stage one is only using the grid fins for steering as it makes its return to Earth. And these grid fins orient the rocket during re-entry and guide the rocket during its descent. Now, the Falcon 9 first stage has nine Merlin 1D engines, and, and each engine generates about 192,000 pounds of thrust. On the second stage is the MVAC engine, which has a slightly wider nozzle. And, that, uh, and the vacuum engine generates about 203,000 pounds of thrust. Next major milestone is going to be the first stage entry burn, which will take place just over a minute from now. There you can see an amazing view of our stage two with its shortened MVAC nozzle. The Falcon 9 first stage, which is not currently on your screen, has reached Apogee and is now beginning its descent back towards Earth. The second stage is continuing to take our Dragon spacecraft to orbit. Now 
And we should see that first stage entry burn begin in about 15 seconds from now on the left side of your screen. One FTS has saved. Stage one entry the burn. The second startup. stage on the right side of your screen. And there's that call out for stage one entry burn startup on the left side of your screen. The second stage is continuing to take our Dragon spacecraft to orbit. Now again, the entry burn is the first of two burns that the Falcon 9 booster performs before landing on our drone ship. Stage one entry burn shut down. And there's that confirmation of stage one entry burn shutdown. As we get closer to first stage landing, it's good to note that the Falcon 9 first stage is equipped with four landing legs made of state-of-the-art carbon fiber with aluminum honeycomb. These landing legs are placed symmetrically around the base of the rocket and deployed just prior to landing. And if successful, this landing will mark the 198th time that we've recovered a first stage booster, including both Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy missions. We are about 25 seconds away from that landing burn beginning. Stage one transonic. Now, as the rocket descends through the Earth's atmosphere, this really puts deceleration into perspective. In the span of less than a minute, we'll have reduced from twice the speed of a jet all the way down to zero as the rocket lands. And as Falcon lands, we may also hear a call out that the second engine will shut off around the same time. Stage one landing burn. Landing leg deploy. Stage one landing burn. <laughs> and and there you have it, the Falcon 9 first stage that supported today's mission has landed for its fifth time, having previously supported Crew-5, GPS-3, Space Vehicle-6, Inmarsat 6F2, and a Starlink mission. Today's landing also marks the 198th successful landing for an orbital class rocket. You may have also heard confirmation of good orbit. Acquisition signal to Finland. At T plus nine minutes and 30 seconds into the mission, we are coming up on the last major task for stage two, commanding separation of Dragon a couple minutes from now. And we expect to have video of Dragon separation from the top of the second stage, which looks into the trunk. CRS-28 will be joining the Crew-6 vehicle currently on orbit, so we'll signal. be back to having two Dragon spacecraft, two Dragon spacecraft docked at the International Space Station. As for cargo, today we will be delivering more than 7,000 pounds of science, research, crew supplies, and vehicle hardware to the orbital laboratory and its crew. To date, SpaceX has sent and brought back over 280,000 pounds of crew and cargo to and from the space station. And we should be seeing Dragon separation about a minute and a half from now. As a reminder, this is the fourth flight for this Dragon capsule, having previously supported CRS-21, CRS-23, and CRS-25 to the space station. Today's flight also marks the 20th reuse of a Dragon vehicle overall. Now, Dragon has 16 Draco thrusters on board, each with the capability to deliver 90 pounds of force. There are four pairs of three thrusters spaced evenly around the capsule, as well as four forward bulkhead thrusters underneath the nose cone. Now, notably, today's Dragon does not have super Draco thrusters, seats, or life support systems, as it's not carrying crew. And this saves on weight and space, and also allows for a faster refurbishment time.
While initial designs of Dragon carried solar arrays extended outward from the trunk, the cylindrical structure located directly behind the Dragon capsule, the current Dragon has these arrays fixed directly to the trunk. And you may see at some point both a light and a dark side of the trunk, and that dark side is actually those solar panels, while the light side is a radiator to help cool the spacecraft. And speaking of solar panels, uh, you can see on your screen right now the solar panels that we will install on the International Space Station. Once the Dragon capsule reaches the ISS, it will be able to autonomously dock using its navigation sensors, centerline camera, and light detection and ranging or LIDAR equipment. And there you can see on your screen Dragon separating from the second stage. Well, that's going to do it for me here in Hawthorne. Dragon the separation next confirmed. milestone coming up is the is the Dragon Nose Cone opening sequence, which protects the double signal. ring Let's and navigational see. sensors. And I'll toss it over to Shaniqua in Houston to talk us through it. Shaniqua? Thanks, Zach. Everything is still going well back here in Mission Control Houston. Right after Dragon separated, it began a series of automatic checkouts, including small firings of the Draco maneuvering thrusters. The next milestone is nose cone deploy. The nose cone protects that docking hardware and rendezvous and tracking elements on top of Dragon during a sit. The nose cone deploy uncovers the four forward bulkhead thrusters, which Dragon will use for its major burn maneuvers. And we do have confirmation that that nose cone deploy sequence has begun. Again, major burn maneuvers will be Dragon nose cone deploy co uncovers those uh, major hardware. It will also uncover Dragon eyes, that rendezvous and tracking hardware that allows Dragon to know where it is in space and how to find the space station. Once open, the nose cone will stay in that position until the very end of its mission, closing prior to re-entry to provide some of that additional protection to the same hardware during re-entry. It does take about five minutes for a nose cone to open. We are looking for 12 hooks, two sets of six that will open here. And once open, we will see the nose cone deploy. Again, that sequence has begun, and we'll be waiting to hear once all 12 hooks are open. And we will see movement of the nose cone as all 12 hooks open. After nose cone deploy, is Cargo Dragon will be safely on its way to the International Space Station. If you're just joining us, NASA and SpaceX's 28th commercial resupply mission launched from Pad 39A at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida at 10.47 a.m. Central Time, 11.47 a.m. Eastern Time, and is currently in orbit. We're standing by now for nose cone deploy. Dragon is filled with over 7,000 pounds of cargo and supplies, including a variety of science investigations, hardware, and fresh foods for the crew on station. Some of those fresh foods that will be delivered include apples, grapefruits, oranges, cherry tomatoes, and blueberries. Dragon will dock to the zenith or space facing side of the Harmony module, just recently freed up by Dragon Freedom, which brought up the Axiom 2 crew. The Axiom 2 crew aboard the SpaceX Dragon Freedom spacecraft safely splashed down off the coast of Florida at 10.04 p.m. Central Time, 11.04 p.m. Eastern on May 30th, 2023. The crew's return officially concluded the second all-private astronaut mission to the International Space Station. Axiom 2 commander and retired NASA astronaut Peggy Whitson ended her eight-day mission with a new record of 675 days in space, the most of any American or woman. And while we're discussing records, NASA astronaut Frank Rubio will end his mission this fall, breaking a record of his own. Rubio will return to Earth aboard a Russian Soyuz spacecraft no earlier than September 27th, and in his stay aboard the Orbiting Laboratory, having logged a total of at least 371 days in orbit. That tour of duty will beat the previous record of 355 days set by NASA astronaut Mark Vandehei in 2022. Joining Rubio on station are six other crew members living and working aboard the National Space Station. Expedition 69 also includes Dmitry Patelin from Roscosmos, Sultan Adiyahi from the United Arab Emirates, Woody Hoberg and Stephen Bowen of NASA, Andrei Fedyayev and Commander Sergei Prokopiev of Roscosmos. 
All crew members are awake, and after enjoying a midday meal, some are headed to exercise, while others are headed to do some spacewalk procedure reviews. NASA astronauts Stephen Bowen and Woody Hoberg are prepping for a June 9th spacewalk to install one of two new rollout solar arrays on the space station's starboard side truss structure. This cargo resupply will bring up two new rollout solar arrays packed inside its unpressurized trunk. Acquisition of signal. Good alley. And again, if you're just joining us, we are currently waiting on nose cone deploy of the CRS-28 cargo spacecraft. That sequence has begun just a few minutes ago, and it does take about five minutes for the nose cone to fully deploy. After confirmation of nose cone, that the nose cone has to been deployed, we will have a special guest join me for a quick interview. He will talk a little more on what Dragon is bringing up and its benefits to the International Space Station. And back here in the International Space Station room, flight control room, while we are waiting for that nose cone to officially be fully deployed, we will have flight controllers that are monitoring the systems on station itself ahead of Dragon's arrival Tuesday morning. Again, once the nose cone is fully deployed, we will have Dragon, Cargo Dragon on its way to the International Space Station. Once Dragon does cross that approach ellipsoid, which is that mythical sphere around the space station, flight controllers here in Mission Control Houston will begin joint operations with SpaceX teams in Hawthorne, California. Again, we will have NASA astronauts Frank Rubio and Woody Hoberg, who will be monitoring the approach and arrival of Dragon with a planned docking time on Tuesday morning at 4.50 a.m. Central Time, 5.50 a.m. Eastern Time, Once Cargo Dragon is docked to the station, Rubio and Hoberg will begin hatch operations to open the hatches between the International Space Station and Cargo Dragon. And again, this is live mission operations of the CRS-28 resupply mission to the International Space Station. If you are just joining us, we are currently waiting on the nose cone deployment of the vehicle. And we currently see that nose cone currently opening. And we have confirmation of nose cone deploy. And there we have it. We have nose cone confirmation of deployment. And now joining me on the phone is manager of the International Space Station Transportation and Integration Office, Phil Dempsey. Hi, Phil. Hey, Shaniqua. Thanks for joining me. And as we get into it, can you outline the major activities for the crew with CRS-28? I know we talked some of what's being brought up, but can you go a little more in depth for us? Sure. The, uh, dur during this mission, there's uh, quite a bit of research that has to be done. So the crew will start, you know, unloading, 
the, the Cargo Dragon. There'll be actually quite a bit of research that's done in time to complete it and return those samples to the ground at the end of this docking mission. As well as that, we're carrying up some irosis, uh, external solar rays that have to be installed with a couple of VVAs during this uh, mission. Of course, and these resupply missions, just like you mentioned, are delivering science, hardware, and other cargo to the station. I know one key delivery on CRS-28 includes a pair of ISS rollout solar arrays. Can you discuss what the plan is for these arrays and what the importance is for station? Yeah, absolutely. So as you know, the ISS program is extending operations to 2030. The robustness of the vehicle has been one of the key factors in our ability to do so. One thing we've seen is expected degradation of solar array performance over time. So these iroses will enable us to get back to beginning of life power levels. With this pair on the SpaceX 28 mission, we'll have augmented six of our eight power channels, further enabling the ISS program to continue full research utilization without interruption. That's why we're here in the first place. Thank you. And as always, I know it's a busy time aboard the International Space Station with cargo vehicles coming and going and multiple planned spacewalks. How complex will the next few months be for the station program and the global partnership? Sure. Well, as always, there's a lot going on. You know, first we have the spacewalks to install the iroses, which I just mentioned. Those are actually some of the most complex that our crew performs. Not long after completing those, we're looking forward to the NG-19 cargo resupply mission later this summer, uh, bring up more critical supplies and, and research. And then we're not too far away from the next crew rotation missions on both the SpaceX Crew Dragon and the Soyuz spacecraft. So we're definitely looking at some complex choreography, but we've got an extremely capable teams across the world making it all happen. Thank you so much. And we, again, appreciate you for joining us today. All right. Thank you. Have a great day. It's good to see a good launch today. Perfect. Thanks, Phil. Joining us, join us again early Tuesday morning at 3.15 a.m. Central Time for live coverage of docking for CRS-28. Again, everything is on track on the International Space Station side, so that will do it for us here in Mission Control Houston. Now back over to you, Kennedy. Jasmine? Thank you, Shaniqua. Yet another beautiful launch from Florida's Space Coast. And that's going to wrap up our launch coverage of the 28th Commercial Resupply Services mission from NASA and SpaceX. Thanks again for joining us, and we'll leave you with a replay of today's launch. Until next time, go NASA, go SpaceX, and go CRS-28.
left hand, I have a, a feather. In my right hand, a hammer. And I guess one of the reasons uh, we got here today was because of a gentleman named Galileo a long time ago who made a rather significant discovery about falling objects in gravity fields. And we thought that uh, where would be a better place to confirm his uh, findings than on the moon. And uh, so we thought we'd try it here for you. Uh, the feather happens to be appropriately a falcon feather. <laughs>